All right. Hey, Nicole, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk with you. And so for those that are listening, we have kind of a cool announcement that I just learned all of 45 seconds ago. <laughs> um, Nicole is not only an FDN herself, which you guys would have heard in the bio, but she actually is officially going to be the newest, I'm guessing, um, FDN mentor, which is that's something, and I, I told her this, and it's not just flattery on the podcast, it is legitimate. I mean, I've been here five years. We talk about all the time, Nicole, on this podcast, how, hey, if you want to pursue the FDN course, that's great, but understand you're going to be studying. There, there's work in this. It's not just, hey, I show up for an hour or two once a week and I get my certificate at the end. It's something that is earned, which is a good trade-off because it's respected. That That's the other side of that. But they're already selective enough about who's getting through, but then to be the someone that's like actually helping these people, um, that's a privilege. So congratulations. And again, welcome to the podcast. But um, I know we're also going to talk about some health stuff today. And that's ideally what I like to do on this show. Now, we always start off on the exact same way as I kind of prefaced with you beforehand. I like to know what the person dealt with because no one gets into this work by accident. So what I'm curious about is when did Nicole's health symptoms start and what did they look like? How far are we going back here? We are going back to my 20s and there I kind of developed a landscape of autoimmunity, celiac disease, hashies. Uh, gut dysbiosis. I had all of that kind of stuff. But when it really became significant for me and super challenging was in my late 30s uh, when I had the onset of a mast cell condition. And so for me, it started with a vaccine, actually. I had gotten a vaccination and within 24 hours, I had the first anaphylactic reaction I'd ever had in my life. Hmm. And so I just didn't understand. It was totally random and weird to me. But then over the next couple of months, I started to have this body breakdown in so many different ways. And it was really bizarre. And uh, it started for me with cardiac symptoms. So when I would go work out in the morning before work, like I had always done, I would go for a jog or something. And I started to get really bad chest pains and shortness of breath and all these weird things were happening. And I ended up seeing a cardiologist and I was failing the stress tests and was admitted to the hospital. And um, they did an angiogram and they couldn't find anything. There were no blockages. Structurally, it was fine. And But there was ischemia and they couldn't tell me why. And so they just put me on beta blockers, which I now know are terrible for people with mast cell conditions. Um, but then I started to become sensitive to everything that I ingested. And it was so bizarre. It was anything I ate, anything I drank, vitamins, supplements that I've been taking for years, anything, medication, what, everything. I was just reacting to everything. And I started to have blood pressure issues. I couldn't get through the day. I would be at work and I'd just go out to my car because I felt so horrible and I just couldn't get through the day and I couldn't figure out why. And during this time, I had probably gone to the ER like 24 times, no exaggeration. Within a couple of months, wow. I was having constant allergic reactions. And um, on one of those visits, I, they wanted to do a CAT scan of my head and neck. And so they gave me iodine contrast dye and I had an anaphylactic reaction to it, which I'd never had in the past, but for them to see it in real time and real person, like, you know, the duck lips and the high and all that, they admitted me into the hospital right away. And mm -hmm. they were like, all right, we got to figure this out. At the same time, I had the onset of POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And so in a really simplistic way, uh, my blood pressure would drop super low. My heart rate would jack up as if I was sprinting. So it'd go up to like 160. Sure. And then the blood would pull on my legs and a lot of times I would faint. And so that was happening too. And so I was in the hospital for I think five weeks total and got the million dollar workup. They had different theories along the way. They thought I had lupus. They thought I had MS. They thought I had um, a a pheocytochroma, which is um, a mass on your adrenal gland that secretes hormones. So there was mm. different theories along the way, but they could never quite figure it out. And when I was in the hospital, I was down to four foods that I could eat without having an anaphylactic reaction. I was in anaphylactic wow. reactions all day, every day. I was on mega Benadryl 24 seven, steroids 24 seven. And I was on a bed alarm because of the pots. I couldn't sit up, stand or walk without fainting. And so I wasn't allowed to use the restroom, the shower, you know, all of that. And so I was basically on my back for like, <laughs> it was horrible. It was such Holy a cow. dark night of the soul type of experience. And mm. 
Um, so I was in there and they really couldn't figure it out. And so I remember it was Christmas and it, it was like the day before Christmas. They're like, okay, we, we can't figure this out. Do you want to go home? <laughs> and I was like, okay. So they discharged me with, and they diagnosed me, which really pissed me off with anxiety. And they told me, you were, you're just anxious. We can't figure this out. And they just shipped me off home, which Who was maddening. And if you're a Who female I'm, and you have Right. And it, but also that wasn't what it was. And I knew that obviously. And so, and I remember too, my dad who came to visit me one day, he's a psychologist and had been for like 50 years. And I remember him getting into an argument with them of like, this isn't anxiety. You know, there's something just because you can't figure it out. It doesn't mean, you know, that tends to be the go-to, particularly with younger females I've found, you know, when they can't figure it out, it's just, all right, you're anxious. So they discharged me with no, I hadn't improved at all. I didn't know what was going on. And so I went home for Christmas to my parents' house and I just was so incredibly sick. I couldn't even sit. They had a room with a fireplace and I couldn't even sit in there because the heat triggered allergic reactions. It was everything. It was so bizarre. And so um, I think it was the day after Christmas, they found me passed out again because they kept finding me passed out places and I was passed out at the top of the stairs. I banged myself up pretty badly and they were like, all right, that's it. They put me in the car and they drove a few hours to Boston where there were a lot of really great uh, medical facilities and they took me to Brigham and Women's Hospital, which happens to have, I think, one of the country's only mass cell centers in their hospital. Hmm. And so... Um, Long story short, after I was there, I got hooked up with their mast cell physicians, and then I subsequently got diagnosed with mast cell activation syndrome. And so that's where the healing journey began. Wow. Okay. All right. Heck of a story. We got plenty to work with today, that's for sure. Um, I'm sorry that all this <laughs> crazy stuff happened, but yeah. at the same time, um, considering now, it's great to see people on the other side because now you're like... Knowing this and now knowing that you're also just became an FDN mentor, uh, that's that's pretty lucky for the people that are going to get to work with you. We need people like that that are teaching this stuff and helping people. So I think that's amazing. And just to be clear, because I didn't want to cut you off, but what I meant with the anxiety is, you know, obviously they give out these totally unfounded diagnoses of like anxiety or depression when people are having legitimate things. And yeah, so we talk about that actually all the time on the show. I just meant in the sense of it's probably not untrue in, in certain sense. Like, of course, someone would be anxious or upset because you have For all sure. this stuff going on, but that's not the problem. Sure. That isn't the, yeah, like that's the least of my problems. That's the it's very a best. Side effect of it. <laughs> right, right. And that's, totally. And I know that's what you meant. And that's what I meant too. It yeah. wasn't the primary issue. It wasn't anxiety. It was a function of what was going on. So yeah, totally get that. Yeah. And yeah, the only reason I even specified is because we don't know each other. And I, I hate the, because that happened to my mom for seven years. It took her seven years to get diagnosed with Graves disease. And they kept saying it's in your head. They offered Xanax, SSRIs and stuff. Yeah. And yeah I'm, yeah, I'm sure she was anxious and depressed, but that's not the core of the issue. Um, so with that all said, the one thing I want to yeah. define actually, before we even go further is what is mast cell activation syndrome? And I, I'm always very honest on this podcast. I know a lot about health. I am not the most advanced FDN in the world. I think my ability and purpose here is to interview people like you. I actually don't know what that condition is. I have heard it listed a million times in AFDNP, but I would not be able to tell someone what that is. So I'd love, I would assume the audience might be in a similar boat, at least some of them. So yeah, what does this diagnosis actually mean? Sure. So there are different, so there's a continuum of mast cell conditions, right? And so I'll talk about the two major ones. So your mast cells are, are white blood cells that are part of your immune system. They're located throughout your body. And they release all types of chemical mediators, things like histamines, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, all of that kind of stuff. And they do that in response to a pathogen or an allergen. Think about if you get like a mosquito bite and that rush and that, that raised lump, that's, that's your mediators going to address the issue. So when you have a mast cell condition, you can, and I'm going to oversimplify it. So you can have too many mast cells in your body. There's a proliferation of them. So you have, they, they react in a normal way, but you just have too many of them. And that can fall under the umbrella of what we call mastocytosis. Um, and then there's mast cell activation syndrome, which is what I was diagnosed with. And that means that you have a normal amount of mast cells in your body. 
However, they become hyperactive and hypersensitive. They go off when they shouldn't. They're in a constant, you're in a constant allergic state. So they're sort of hyper-regulated. And so that's typically when people are talking about mast cell conditions, those are the two types that they're talking about. Okay. And um, a lot of times now people are talking about mast cell activation syndrome um, because okay. I've, I've seen a lot of people talking about it lately. And, um, and particularly in post COVID too, I've, I've found a lot of long haulers have mast cell activation type issues going on. Got it. All right. So this is one of those things where, I mean, I believe this with most of the things that we list off in the show, the diagnoses that people come on with, it seems like this is in many senses a result of the modern world or there's contributing factors from the modern world that lead to these things, because it's one of those situations where the symptomology that you're describing, I have heard people say before, but even in our world of functional medicine, it's not like this is the most common thing. Like I hear like Hashimoto's a lot, right? That That's totally typical. That's almost par for the yeah. course half the time, the gluten sensitivities or whatever, but this is getting a little more specific, even in the world of functional. Now, what I did not know, um, admittedly, is that there was even a proper, I, I did not realize that was a Western medicine diagnosis that was actually given. So what on earth do they make of this? Like, what do they do? Because I'm going to guess it is dramatically different than the approach that we might take if we're trying to self-heal. <laughs> Yeah, so getting a diagnosis can be tough for people. Um, typically how they diagnose you is a bone marrow biopsy. They'll take serum tryptase levels or they'll um, do a 24-hour urine catch and they'll look for histamine levels, prostaglandin levels, leukotriene levels. Um, but the, the key, though, is if you have mast cell activation syndrome, you have to be in a flare at the time they do the test. So if you're feeling pretty stable and pretty good and you're not symptomatic, it'll come back normal. And so a lot of times people will get diagnosed just off symptomology alone if they have those symptoms, but also if they take antihistamines and they feel better, that tends to be the markers that, that those um, immunologists and allergists look for. Um, but how they typically treat it is with a combination of medications. So they will do high dose antihistamines, H1 and H2 blockers. So the H1s are things like Claritin, Benadryl, Zyrtec, um, the H2 blockers are things like Tagamet, Pepsid, that kind of stuff. And then they'll typically give you some type of mast cell stabilizer and medication. And that's something like chromalin sodium and um, ketodafin. And then sometimes they'll give you a leukotriene inhibitor. And that's something like Singular. And there are other meds that they try out on you sometimes. They do Zolaire injections with some people, low-dose naltrexone with some people. So it's a combination of mast cell stabilizers and then the antihistamines, but it's mega dosing. Like I was on enough Benadryl to kill a horse, like in the beginning, like I just, it's so much. They, they just pump you full of those things to get you to, to calm down the allergic reaction and calm your mast cells down. So it's very different approach than the FDN approach for sure. Is there, and listen, I, we, I specify this as much as I can. And it's usually every episode because it's important in case, God forbid, someone is listening for the first time. I can never forget that just because it's routine for me, it might not be routine for the person listening. Um, guys, we're not against Western medicine in any way. No FDN, uh, that I know no, of is no, like, no, that's no, just no, not, no, no. yeah, but th this is clearly what you just described. Nicole, is not something that really has an end game plan. That is fair to say. It's more like, hey, we have some treatments right. for this. That's and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that did help to some degree. But these are things that have very severe long term side effects, even if, you know, you're just on normal amounts of antihistamines are not fantastic for the body, let alone mega dosing. And at the end of the day, the thing people need to understand is it's not getting to the root of the issue. So I mean, is this right. that, that's what I'm kind of curious, because I don't know, I, I'm learning about the syndrome, I'm learning about the Western medicine approach with it, like, did they just tell you, hey, you're going to be on this stuff for the rest of your life? Or what was what was the thought? Process? Yeah, so it was it was interesting. And, and I agree with you, I want to, I want to put this disclaimer, like you just said, I'm not at all against the meds. And if you're anaphylactic, <laughs> like I was, you need the meds in the beginning, like don't, Damn. and I'm somebody who's very much into all, you know, alternative and natural holistic health. And I knew I needed the meds in that at that time. And that's okay. So it don't ever stop taking them, especially if you're anaphylactic, if you're not, you know, under the care of a, of a provider, because it could be really bad. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's more managing symptoms. And, and for me at the time, they would say, I remember I had a doctor say to me, well, you should just go on disability and learn to live with this. 
And I remember every cell in my body would reject it. That was like, absolutely not. That's not why I'm here. No, no. And so I knew in that moment, I would have to find my own way out of it and be my own health detective and my own advocate. And so that's, that's what I did. But yeah, so it's, it's more managing symptoms, right? So they put you on these meds. Um, some people are able, you know, I, I remember talking to my mass cell physician about this at one point, and she was saying that sometimes a lot of people will have some sort of turnaround point, and, but she couldn't tell you when. It could be 20 years from now. But the idea is for them to wean you off of it once you get to a good place. But it could be 10 years. It could be 20 years. It's There's no real plan for it. It's just what meds are helping stabilize you, and let's just keep doing mm-hmm. that. And so that was always okay. the message I got from the traditional world. Okay. All right. And that's a, this is a perfect example in, in your case because, yes, the medicine literally saves your life um, when that was needed at that time to yeah. get the anaphylaxis under control, right? So that, that's just always the realistic perspective we want. And I think it's one of the great things that separates FDN because a lot of people, even in the functional space and natural space, and I'm not talking about specific programs. I'm just talking about individuals that are in this space. They do uh, – they yeah. kind of – get a little thing, little problem with Western medicine. And yes, guys, it does things wrong, but I try to think of people as opposed to the system. I know doctors, I'm sure you do as well. They're usually amazing people that are (laughs) doing this work to help others just like we do this work. So if you want to get mad at the system, and I, I am mad at the system in this case, yes, it saves your life. And that's not a small detail, but there is no plan here. Saying disability for the rest of your life is not a plan, but that's the system saying it, right. not the doctor. The doctor cares about you. That's why they're saying go on disability, right? right? They're not just handing that stuff out. Exactly. I mean, it's not as, I know that there's some people that believe that it's easy to get on that. That is not a particularly easy thing to get. Um, there's a lot of things that have to happen before someone gets disability. So where do you even, where do you even go after this, Nicole? And, and one thing I actually haven't established with you yet is were you, busy? you're talking 20s, 30s, were you in the health space at all or were you in a completely different field of work? So I was in a different field of work. However, I had just finished my master's degree in nutrition. And so I had started to do <laughs> a little bit of, I had been apprenticing with my nutrition mentor. She is a a well-known nutritionist and had a thriving practice. So I'd been doing it, but I hadn't gone out on my own yet. And I was in a different okay. field of work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So then one, so, of the, one of the things, oh, sorry. We have a delay guys. I apologize. Neither of us is cutting over each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was going to say to your point earlier about um, Western medicine or traditional medicine and how we kind of tend to just thumb our nose at that completely I had to learn that myself because I kind of did that in the beginning. I I was all about everything natural and holistic and I didn't want to take meds and I didn't want to do that. I would, but that's what my body needed at that time. And I had to get over that and realize that there's a place for it. Sometimes it's appropriate to use it and it's okay if you do. It doesn't. So I really had to learn that lesson in, in that experience. Gotcha. Okay. I like to figure out people's, we can call it a aha moment or whatever, because all right, you already had an interest in the nutrition side at the very least. You're not actively doing it per se, like in, in work wise, but you have an interest in it more than the average person. I'm kind of curious though, at what point does Nicole decide or realize or whatever that, okay, I got this diagnosis, because that's the main thing. When we're suffering with extreme symptoms, as many of our guests have suffered with, you're not necessarily thinking about okay, the natural side or whatever, you're trying to figure out what is wrong, what what needs to be done. And then once we get the diagnosis, especially when it's a not so great one that really there doesn't seem to be a solution to, that is when there's a potential for someone to start maybe thinking outside the box or doing something else. So when do you have the moment that you're like, okay, wait a second. All right, I'm now stuck with this thing. I'm being told to go on disability in a, in a way. When do you have the moment that you go try nutrition or functional stuff? Like how does that transition happen for you? Yeah, it was actually right away. It was actually when I was in the hospital. And I remember talking a lot to my nutritionist, my mentor, and she was like, you know, I really think you need to look into this mast cell thing. I think it sounds like what you have. And so at the time, I had my little laptop, and I would just Google, research, find anything that I could find about mast cell conditions. And it really resonated with me at TRACT. And so I was looking for resources and there really wasn't a lot out there, but there was someone, she was known as the low histamine chef in this world. Her name uh, in that space, her name was um, 
Yasmina Kellenstam. And so I eventually hooked up with her and, and did a consult with her in, in that she had mast cell activation and syndrome as well. And she sort of made her life's work about it and about nutrition and, and how to work with these conditions. So I consumed everything I could find about it. And then I just started my own sort of investigation with myself. And so I did a lot of different things and I started first with diet and I thought, okay, I can't, because I was down to, I think when I was out of the hospital initially, I was eating six foods and that was it. And so your inclination when, especially when you're anaphylactic is I'm going to stay in that little bubble. I, this is where mm -hmm. I feel safe. And I'm just going to stay here. And I did that for a while. But what I started to happen was I started to have side effects of nutrient deficiencies. I started to have dental problems. I lost most of my hair. Like all of these things were happening. And I knew intuitively like, all right, I'm not giving my body what it needs to begin to heal at all. Like I had no fat in my diet. I had no greens in my diet. I had, was missing major, major nutrients. So at the same time, though, I was anaphylactic. So you can't just start eating these foods. You have to desensitize your body and reintroduce them back in. Hmm. So what I started with was just a food journal. And I personally hate doing them. They're a pain in the butt. Like, they're super tedious. But I wrote down everything I ate, when I ate it, what symptoms I felt, what meds I took. Like, and I just started to look for patterns. Because as you know from FDN, you can have a sensitivity to something and it can show up the next day. Like you could have a headache and it's from you know the chicken you ate the night before. So I just started yeah. to keep really meticulous logs of what I was doing. The next thing I did was I started to log my food into an app. And I think I used fitday.com at the time, but you can use something like chronometer is really great. I know a lot of FDN uh, folks like to use that. But what I would do is I'd look at my meals and I'd look at the macros, I'd look at the profile, and I'd look at what I was deficient in. And so then I would look for foods to reintroduce that had those, that was high in that nutrient. So say, for example, I was low in magnesium, I would look for high magnesium foods. So I was very selective when I chose what food to work with to reintroduce. And so, um, and I would always go for really, really nutrient dense foods. I mean, your inclination is like, yeah, I'd like to have some chips back in my life or something like that. But I would instead pick, you know, something like I would do like dandelion greens or something that was really giving me a lot of bang for my buck. And then I would work with mm -hmm. that food and I'd work to reintroduce it, microdose, get it, get my system, immune system to not tag it as a problem. And so I would just work and it was painstakingly slow, but that's what I did at first was just work on diet because I knew that I couldn't sustain what I was doing. Um, and I used the MRT test too, which I know we use in FDN um, quite a bit. It's one of the five foundational labs that they use. And I had actually been trained by Oxford Biomedical Labs to administer that test and interpret that test. So I started to use it um, quite a bit and in my practice too. And my initial thought though, which was interesting was, because the clients I work with primarily have mast cell issues. And I remember thinking, well, what's the point of running this test on them? We, we're releasing mediators 24 seven, like it's just gonna yep. always be red and yellow. And it wasn't the case, it wasn't at all. So um, I found that to be particularly helpful. And then I just built from there. So I just started with diet alone and just worked mm -hmm. on expanding back out and getting some nutrients back in. And once I started to do that, I started to immediately feel better. And so okay. that was my first step was diet. Wow. Okay. You, I don't know if you realize this, but you read my mind. I was about to ask about the MRT thing. I've been wondering that since you mentioned yeah. that it was these mediators coming out. I'm like, okay, I wonder what this looks like actually on the test. Now yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by this because you said you would, yeah, you'd assume that everything would just be lit up, but that wasn't the case. But so are you noticing because the MRT damn good science behind it. So I'm kind of wondering here, are you noticing an inconsistency between like the per because you could only eat so many foods. Like, can you right. eat things that, um, how should I word this? It's, no, I know what you mean. Sorry, like, you know what I'm trying to say? I, like, is there problems like inconsistencies with the MRT? It, no, I think what it does and how I've used it, it doesn't mean, so you get your test back and you're like, oh, wow, look at all these, some green foods here. I can just start eating them. You can't, you still have to desensitize your body to them, but it gives you, mm -hmm. for me, it gives me a, a starting point. So I know if we're going to work on reintroducing foods and apple is a red food for you, and we're not going to try that. I'm going to try, whereas if apple's a green, we'll start with apple and it, and it might go faster than something else, you know? So 
Um, it doesn't mean that you can just start eating whatever you, any green food that's on there. I, for me, I found that it's a good starting point of know where to focus. You still have to desensitize yourself to it, which I know sounds a little Understood. bit weird, but you can't just start. Okay. So what, because what I'm trying to figure out then is because the MRT, again, very good test. I've talked about it a million times on here. People know I, I love it. But if people like yourself that dealt with this thing are having such extreme reactions, why, what would be a circumstance? Like, how could Apple come back as green if you couldn't technically eat a full Apple without the whole desensitization process? Like, where is the inconsistency there is what I'm trying to figure And it's not literally an inconsistency, but why does it appear to be that way? Yeah, I think that it's just your immune response is so hyper-regulated that I don't have a good scientific answer for you as to why, like you're asking, why aren't you releasing, why aren't they finding that mediator release? And it, I don't yes. have a good answer for that, for as to why that is. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I like people that can do what I attempt to do, which is like, hey, I didn't know about mast cell, right? I'll ask about it. And then we don't know that. So now we have something fun to study after this podcast. And if I figure it yeah. out, I will let you guys know in a subsequent episode. <laughs> um, not important. Um, I also, I kind of was thinking, though, that because you had mentioned at one point, not only could the mast cells, I think you had said that there could be like a normal response, but there's more of them than you would expect. And I'm kind of wondering if maybe that's where the line gets drawn. Because if it, if they're just measuring the severity of the reaction well whatever now i'm getting too much into the weeds i apologize next topic right you're saying like <laughs> so, if somebody has too many you're saying if somebody has too many of them and they're releasing a normal amount of mediators it'll be more extreme because there's more of them versus somebody based, who does not based on the limited information yeah. that i have from this podcast that's my theory <laughs> so we'll see okay. if that uh <laughs> works out to be true one day I'll hit up oxford they're great people they'll answer too that's the best part so they are really knowing great. what you know Knowing what you know now, having gone through FDN, would you have started with just the diet stuff? Because I know FDN is a system and I mean, this is a particularly kind of crazy case. I mean, it's extreme. Like, would you do the exact same thing that you did or would you run all of the labs that were supposed to run right from the get go on someone like you? So I tend to run labs and the people that I work with, but I do start with diet first. Bef so say, for example, everybody has a different different pieces to their puzzle, right? So hormones can be a huge piece. That's it. So I always will run a Dutch, you know, gut dysbiosis can be a huge piece for people. There can be underlying pathogens like SIBO, um, parasites, candida, all that kind of stuff. But I will run that to see what the landscape is for the person. But I always start with diet first and start with getting them, their mast cells stabilized, whether it's through pharmaceuticals that they're taking or it's through natural yeah. alternatives because there are, are some alternatives to the medications. They have to be in a stable place before we go after any of those other things because then it'll just be, they won't be able to tolerate that. So I wanna make sure that they're stabilized first, they have a good healthy diet going on and um, that their detox channels are open before we do any of that work, that they have a binder on board if we're going after a pathogen. I, so diet is always where I start first because I feel like we have to have a good foundation laid before we go after the more complicated pieces of what's going on for them. Okay. That makes sense because I was wondering, I'm like, all right, well, so many of the test results, even though it's not just clearly what we do here is not run tests and then use supplements, but like it, it's... Right a part of some of the tests. So I was wondering, I'm like, well, if these people are reacting this extremely to otherwise normal things, I mean, there's people that react to the gut yeah. supplements all the time and they're otherwise non-reactive yeah. to most things. So I figured that yes. might not be always the, the best bet. So what you described makes a yeah. lot more sense. Um, and I got I usually would say this for the end, but I, I'm so curious and there's gotta be other people that are wondering right now. I mean, you seem like you're in a, a much better place. So where are we at now? How long did it take to get here? And like, what what is here? Because we're not looking for perfection on the show. Very few FDNs are at that, but you seem like you're doing better. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And um, you know, it's funny. I had a health coach hit me up once who also had a mast cell issue. And she, I remember asking me, well, how many foods can you eat now? And I can't remember what I told her. It was like 30 or something at the time. And she said to me, well, I don't consider that healing unless you, I could eat anything I want. And I was the way I was before. And it's like, well, you're, you're probably never going to get there. And I think people have this idea that healing means perfection or getting back to where you were. And for me, it doesn't mean that. I think you have to, you're not going to, I'm not going to be the same person I was before the onset of this condition. That's just not going to happen. But it doesn't mean that you can't get 80% there, 90% there. 
and there might be some things that you always have to manage or look out for. Um, but for me, it's been, I, it's been almost 10 years, you know, so this has been a long journey for me, but, um, yeah, it took me a couple, the first couple of years were not good. <laughs> I was just sort of managing symptoms and not really progressing like I like to, but I would say over the last, uh, five years, I really gained a lot of traction and, and doing the FDN nice. course helped me quite a bit with the functional lab testing and gaining, you know, proficiency in that and using that on myself too, to find pieces of the puzzle. Like for example, um, I absolutely love, love, love the Dutch test now. And, and I learned mm -hmm. how to, to utilize it through FDN and because there's such a relationship between estrogen and histamine. And for me, it was a huge piece of my puzzle that I never really paid attention to before, which sounds kind of stupid, but hormone balance was key for me. You know, um, estrogen causes, a, it can cause a histamine release. In contrast, progesterone is a mast cell stabilizer. It helps boost your DAL, which helps break down dietary histamine. So my hormones, I was super, super crazy high in estrogen, super crazy low in progesterone and testosterone. So when I was able to balance out my hormones, that was a key piece. So there was different steps along the way for me that really propelled me forward. And um, yeah, I'm super high functioning and <laughs> happy. And yeah, that's life is good. And that, that's what yeah. matters. Yeah. And it's, I, I like these stories and I appreciate your honesty because that's, we want to give people realistic oh, yeah. expectations and considering where you were at to be able to get to, I mean, I'm saying hypothetically, even 50% better would be life changing, but to 80, 90, to know that that's something people can, can aspire to. And I'm in the same, I'm in the same boat, you know, um, I don't, there's certain things that I have to maintain in my yeah. life to have this yes. level of health. Like one of the weirdest ones is even though most people, especially like my close friends, they know me as this, this nut because I work all the time, but I'm really strict with the sleep because the second yeah. I can go the 12, 14 hours a day doesn't bother me. I run my labs. Ironically, I'm completely good because I like what I do and I'm, I'm calm when I do it. But the minute I decide that I'm going to go to bed past 10 PM, I feel it the next yeah. day. It, you can give me seven days in a row of 12 hours a day, totally fine. So long as I went to bed at like nine thirty, nine forty five. If I go to bed at 11, I will literally feel that the yeah. next day. And it's the funniest thing coming from a 26 year old, but that's yeah. how it is. And you know, I don't, I don't want to drink alcohol anyway, but I, I don't do that. And I think that's to my advantage because even people that have just a few drinks per week, yeah. I mean, alcohol is a toxin, you know, I don't, I don't know that the benefits yeah. that red wine gives could not be right. obtained from somewhere else with, right. <laughs> so without the downside that comes from the alcohol. So anyway, it's just, yeah, it's all about working up to your best. And if God forbid you are someone listening to this podcast that has not gotten to a severe state of health yet, one of the smartest things I think you could ever do, and it would take such a special person to be able to do this. I know very few of them, but to be able to see consequences of your current actions before they actually exist and then maybe make your life a little more disciplined now this is my theory i i just from being in the space the space for over eight years fdn for five i genuinely believe that people that are healthy right now and willing to do some of the health stuff before it's a necessity they can probably go back and forth and eat the cheesesteak and the gluten cake at you know thanksgiving for the rest of their life and i honestly think they're going to be okay but once you again, oversimplified, but maybe like activate yeah. these pathways, yeah. you could call it, whether it's autoimmunity, mast cell, whatever, that seems to be more on the permanent yes. side. And there's always going to, you can get better, but there's going to have to be some regulation exactly. there. So let's avoid it. Exactly. <laughs> let's be smart enough exactly. to avoid it before it ever happens. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the key with mast cell issues too, is you have to know what your triggers are because they're different and people, we hyper-focus on food, but it's temperature, it's exercise, it's environmental allergens and uh, air quality, all of those different things can trigger you. So for me, I know what my triggers are and I just try to avoid them. <laughs> just so I know what's going to bother me and what isn't. So I can plan for that. Okay. The one thing I wanted to ask before we get into more, because I want to talk about some FDN yeah. stuff as well, like in, in the terms of you going through the course and now being a mentor. But the one thing I was wondering is I know that in FDN, sometimes you're lucky and you can find the root causes, but Reed Davis, the founder, also talks about sometimes you'll never know exactly what the specific root cause was. It could be so far upstream, but the system still works nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So it's not always important, but of course, it's satis uh, satisfying for people to know, oh, maybe this is what led to this. So is there any, like, what what's what's the theory, belief yeah. behind why this happened to you? Because I know in the beginning, um, when you were telling your story, at one point you had mentioned that you had 
had a vaccine administered to you and it led to this. So, and guys, by the way, oh my God, I shouldn't have to say this, but this is not an anti-vaccine thing. Vaccines are medications that people didn't know. And every medication known to man has side Absolutely. effects. So the fact that like some people believe that they're just don't know. No one said don't take them, but they have side right. effects just like anything else. It's kind of crazy yeah. that we think that that's not possible. Um, but okay, so yeah, what what what's causing? So yeah, it's so funny you said that because when I was initially was telling my story and mentioned vaccines, I thought, well, maybe I should say <laughs> I'm not. It's not an anti-vaccine. And for me, I want to be clear: like the vaccine triggered the onset of it. It didn't cause it. And there's a difference between those two hmm. things, right? So I went into that vaccine. I was not in a good place. I was incredibly, I had been running on a stress response for the last two years straight. I'm sure I was in the exhaustive phase of HPA access dysfunction. I just wasn't healthy. I'd gone through some traumas in the couple of years leading up to it. So I wasn't in a good place when you, when I was in front of the doctor and got the vaccine. So I think it just was the trigger of it. Now it can have, you know, some people have the genetic components for a mast cell condition. For some people, mast cell activation syndrome is secondary to something else. And so a lot of times what I have found, it's Lyme, it's mycoplasma, um, it's mold toxicity, it's those types of things. And if you can manage that and heal those underlying conditions, it calms down. Like, for example, for me, POTS was secondary to the mast cell activation syndrome. So once I got my mast cells, you know, on calmed down and regulated and balanced, then I the pots went away. So, you know, I think it's, okay. it depends on the person for some people, it's a secondary thing. You know, I've seen a lot of people with long haul COVID who now have mast cell activation type things going on. So it could be secondary to the virus that they just dealt with. So it just depends on the person for some people it's genetic and, and that's what it is, but it just depends on the person. Got it. It seems um, I'm noticing again, this is a very ignorant take because I'm just learning this today, but it almost seems like, all right, COVID, Lyme, a vaccine in your case. And yes, these are the final triggers per se, but it almost seems like the mast cell could be activated commonly by things that create quite a burden yes. for our yes. immune system, like a vaccine, like COVID, like Lyme. And then, yes, you mix in the other lifestyle factors, final yes. straw. Okay, cool. We're going to react to damn everything because the world's yes. dangerous 100%. and we need to protect this host. Right. And so you have to look okay. at too. Hmm. That's why, you know, your detox channel. So yeah, it, they're heavy burdens, right? But it depends on the person's ability to handle those burdens, right? So if your detox channels aren't working properly, say you have some methylation SNPs where it's a little bit more challenging for you. And so then you can't tolerate it, right? And I think that's where the vaccine injury piece comes in and, and those other types of things. So I think it just depends on your body's ability to handle the toxic burden that you're putting it through with those things. Okay, cool. Well, this has been great. I want to transition a little bit to FDN yeah. itself because we always, most of the people that are listening to this are either interested in working with someone from like the FDN world. So we'll shout out your business at the end as well. Um, or two, they're considering the course and they just want to know more about it. So how did you, did you go through the FDN course? This is a better question. Did you go through the course to self heal solely or did you kind of know you wanted to do this? Because I know that obviously you were looking for self healing components, but I, I'm, curious as whether as to whether or not that was the only goal because that was my only goal at the time and then here i am doing the podcast right <laughs> but for you i'm curious like what was the perspective going in did you know you wanted to do this work i did know that i wanted to do this work and i'd heard so many wonderful things about this training um and sure there was a self-healing element um, to it as well i'm always interested in finding things that will help me advance mm -hmm. forward with my health but it had such a wonderful reputation and i'd known uh, a few people that gone through it themselves and and just spoke really highly of it being able to be trained in functional labs was a huge draw for me and that's that's why i wanted to do it Okay. So when you went through the course and listen, you're more than welcome. Please yeah. be honest about things that you think could be improved, things that you loved. It's all good. But what did you, did, did the course meet your expectations? Did you like the mentorship? Did you like how things were done? Um, I'd love to know about your experience so others can kind of get a feel for what it's like sure. to go through it. I loved it. It was actually the best training that I've ever done. And I've done quite a few. And I think I mentioned this to you earlier. What I liked about it is FDN makes you work for it. They don't just give you the certificate. You don't just watch modules and maybe you take a quiz and it's easy and you, you know, you pass through and then you get your certificate. 
I loved that you guys incorporated um, practical exercises where you would actually have a mentor who helps you through the program. You role play, you interpret labs together, you interpret your own labs and then clients labs. And FDN really makes sure that you understand the material, but also that you know how to apply it. Because if you don't know how to actually integrate it into your practice work that you do, then what's the point? It's just theoretical. So I really loved that you guys really, really train people hard. You make sure that they know what they're doing before you let them out into the world as an FDN. So I really appreciated that because yeah. not a lot of trainings do that. You know, and I've been through trainings and I'm sure yeah. other practitioners have as well, where I'm at the end and I'm like, I want all of my money back. Like this was not worth it, you know? And so this, I didn't feel that way. I loved this training. I loved it. It was fantastic. I, yeah. I, that's awesome. And I, I laughed a bit when you said that it's the best one that you've been through because I was recalling your bio and how much you have done. So that that's saying something. That's great. And um, yeah, the FDN course, I mean, for I, it stinks because when you're obviously involved with the company, then I don't know if anyone truly believes you. But I always say, I mean, Nicole, I would have paid the cost of tuition just to have access to yes, FDNP. Yes, yes. That's how, you know, I mean... Guys, we're talking about things that are serious, yes. like it's it's health issues. These are the people, the people that are mentoring in the FDN course. They're not famous. They're not right. names that you're hearing about everywhere. These are the people that I would go to and have a family member work with if a family member, God forbid, was diagnosed yeah. with cancer. They'd be working alongside yeah. the oncologist with my family member because that's how much faith I have in them. And I can go into a group. Any day of the week, Saturday, Sunday, too, I can type in a question, whether it's about something with business, which is also kind of interesting. I could ask, hey, I need to scale. I have three employees. Has yeah. anyone done that? Yes. Or, hey, I have this very complex condition. I've never even heard of it. A client came with it. Oh, yes, I've heard of that. This is what this is, right? And they got all these links for you and stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a really special place. So the training itself, I mean, you go take on two clients you make the money back and they're happy to pay you that money because you're the first person that was actually able yeah, to Yeah, and you're them. so right. I should have mentioned the ongoing support that you get when you through AFNDP. I mean, it, they don't, FDN doesn't end their relationship with you when you get your cert, your certification. You can stay on, like you said, there's training webinars every week. There's case studies. If you have a really difficult case, you can bring your case to the clinical advisors and mentors and and present it and they'll help you troubleshoot. There are private Facebook groups where you can ask clinical questions of your peers. There's so much that you can do going on and there's so much support from the FDN community that you're really never yeah. on your own. I mean, it's it's really fantastic. I've never seen anything like it in any other training that I've done. Yeah. I agree that it's not the end of the relationship. And in a sense, it's almost the beginning because now you're in a different world because the AFDNP thing is voluntary in, in, in the sense that everyone that's an FDN goes through the FDN Facebook trainee group. And that's a special place. I like I like that I'm involved with that because I still get to post some encouraging yeah. comments or just give some insight every now and then. But when you join AFDNP, okay, this is the separation from the people who did the course and, and that's wonderful and we're glad you did it versus, all right, I'm actually going to go take this to the next level. I'm going to do this as some part of my life, whether it's a part-time job, full-time business, I'm starting a speaking career on the topic, whatever it might be. And so you're really working with people. I, I'm seeing the same names in there. And then of course, much more now, but that have been in there for the whole five years that I've been mm -hmm. involved. Right. And you really, you get to be close with some people that are doing this work for real. It's, it's pretty special. So I know that you've had your business now um, for a good amount of time. So what do you, are you serving these specific niches or do you bring on a bunch of different people? Like who's your ideal client might be a better way to say it. I, I primarily work with people with mast cell conditions, but also other, you know, autoimmune, that kind of thing. But what I really love to do is help people who are just recently diagnosed with a mast cell condition, who have no clue what's going on or where to go or what to do. I find that I'm most helpful with those types of clients um, and help orient them, help figure out the pieces to their puzzle um, and so that's where I tend to focus, but I do work with, with, you know, people with gut health issues, autoimmune issues. I don't limit it just to mast cell, but I find most people who find me are, are people with mast cell conditions. Very cool. I, uh, to the degree that you're able, because I know that there's private things that we can't share, but again, to what's comfortable for you and them, is there any client success stories that really stick out that might be worth sharing? Because I feel like for, it's one thing to be doing FDN in general, but with the specific things that you're kind of working with, I feel like these people are so damn lost yeah. sometimes and probably quite hopeless because they've really been right. given no hope other than, hey, here's some high-dose medication. So I, I'd love to know if you have any client testimonials that stick out. 
Um, yeah, I, it was, I just, I heard recently from a client, it was really funny when I worked with her, she was super sick. And I remember, um, doing a a zoom consult with her, a video consult with her and her mom was with her and she's an adult, you know, in her thirties. And she just couldn't even sit up. Like she was laying on her mom's lap and she was just so incredibly ill and just in so much despair and and just thought, and I remember her asking me, you know, we went through, you know, everything and her just being super concerned about not just how do I feel about her physically, but how do I get my life back? Because in so many cases, it completely rips you out of your life, your relationships, your job, your finances and all of that. And, and she was worried about, I remember her asking me about dating and, you know, am I ever going to have a relationship again? And am I ever going to feel better again? And so we worked together for a period of time and I got a message from her about a year later and it was so funny. She had moved to California. She was out in the world again and she was feeling, she had her healing breakthrough and she turned that corner and now she was going out to restaurants and she had a new relationship and she was so happy. And I remember just being, feeling so happy for her that she was, she was able to create a new life for herself that made her happy and brought her joy and had all aspects of it. She had a work life, a personal life. Mm-hmm. Her health was sig- dramatically improved. And so and those cases are ones that always, always make me happy because it's not just about, you know, getting them to be able to eat more foods or do whatever. It's about them being able to create a life that makes them happy and where they feel like they're contributing to the world yeah. and they have meaningful relationships. And, and so that's really my goal is to help people that get back into the world. Wow. That's uh, that's pretty cool, and it's even cooler that you get to call that yeah, work, absolutely. right? <laughs> uh, that, that's literally well, work. You know, that, I that's think the sometimes business. When we um, when we when people have serious or chronic or complex health issues, we tend to focus on the physical, like eat this food, take this supplement or this med or whatever. But we don't talk mm-hmm. about the rest of your life and how it gets affected. You know, it's like some people can't work anymore, or they're partner leaves them or, you know, and it can be really, really devastating in so many ways. And so I think we don't, we don't talk about that enough about dealing with illness and how it affects it, the ripple effects of it in all areas of your life. So. Yeah, I think, um, I really, even though I don't relate to the condition, I, I just related to the story because instantly when you, even you just talked about that, Hey, it's a 30 year old person that has to like lay on their mom basically to get through the call. Um, I just thought about certain stuff in my own family, my mom and myself with certain things because yeah, it's, I would say the lifestyle stuff sometimes is what's yeah. killing you even worse than yeah. the physical things because we, we, you are maybe not consciously, but in the back of your head, you kind of know that this right. is not forever, right? We're not here that long. And so with each year that goes by with one of these things, you're just like, holy crap, like I, I don't get that back. I don't get that back. It's um, it is it's just a little debilitating. And now people like you and I, thank God, we wouldn't ever change anything because we get to live passions and do what we want to do. But no, at the time, like as an 18 year old kid, where I can't even eat more than 400 milligrams right. of salt in a meal without extreme vertigo, that right. sucked, you know. And it's kind of funny because I don't even know if I actually wanted to be a person who would like go to college and and drink and go to parties. But it's almost this thing in your head. It's like, well, at least I exactly. wish I would have had the option. Like, I want to go to a party. I want to meet cute girls. Like, you know, like you kind of want to do that. And I'm sitting here. I can't even eat salt, let alone go out and hang out with you guys till 3 a.m. That's just not going to work. Uh, but again, looking back, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a damn thing, but it's tough when we're in the moment. So to be able to give those experiences to people who might not ever work in the health space, that's, that's pretty rewarding. Yeah, you have to. And I've always found too, because I don't know about you, but if I go through a phase where maybe I have a flare, cause I, you know, they don't happen as, in the same way or in the same frequency. But if I'm in a flare, my immediate reaction is to get down about it. I'd be like, are we back here again? Like, and, but what I'll do is I'll think back to where I started from and think about, okay, like you were literally in a wheelchair. You can go out of the house, like and walk around, but like, you're going to be fine. Like, so it's all about perspective and always knowing that it'll pass. You will very much get to a different place if you, you know, put in the effort to do it. So. Yeah. Everyone always talks about gratitude and what it does is it creates the most authentic, genuine gratitude for life you've ever had. Um, I do, I I do speaking in schools for like the mental health stuff. And I don't actually talk about the functional side there. It's more just a motivational speech to get them to talk in general, right? Get them help, get them on the right track. And 
it's funny because sometimes you got to do, it's not always, but like, I'll have to do like six presentations in a day, back to back to back to back to back. And the teachers will say, how do you have so much energy to do this? Especially with what you're describing. It's like, I don't even know that I have the energy, but what I'm remembering every time I try to get tired or not try, but every time I'm getting tired with that, what I try to do is instantly remember, dude, you wanted to end your life eight years ago, nine years ago. And now you're standing up here with the ability. All you got to do is give it your all for 40 minutes and you could change that for someone else. That's a gratitude. You can't fake. You can journal about it all you want, but that's authentic to people like us who have, there's a gift to this. So if you're out there suffering, remember on the other side of this is a gratitude that most people will never get to experience. And that's what makes the work so much better. You have such an empathy and a shared experience that you can't teach as a practitioner. You just, you lived it and you know it. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's so important to, to stay in that space of gratitude yeah. and um, hope for people. Amazing. All right, Nicole, we will wrap it up here. I want to know where people can find you because out of all these episodes, like I said, you're the first one to come on and talk about this. And guys, you're dealing with an FDN mentor, so I'm totally biased, but I think it's fair to say that if you can work with someone like Nicole for conditions like this or something similar, you're probably pretty wise to do it. So where can oh, they find you? Oh, thanks so much. So uh, my website is forginghealth.com and you can find me there. I'm also on Facebook under the same name. And uh, yeah, you can mm-hmm. reach out there. Sweet. We will have that in the show notes, of course. And then, Nicole, we will finish up with the signature final question on the Health Detective podcast. It's not anything okay. too crazy. Don't worry. Uh, but it does challenge our practitioners because we we always think in bio indiv- uh, individual ways. So it might get you there. But the question is, if I could give Nicole a magic wand in this case, and you could wave it and get every single person in this world to do one thing for their health, whether that's literally do one thing or stop doing one thing, What's the one thing you'd get them to do? Oh, gosh. I would say eat whole foods. Stop eating processed food. 